air conditioning happens to be one of them. How many are glad we moved out of that sweltering city? How many would have drank in a room like that? It wouldn't matter if you would have just drank it up, you'd have drank even more. That's kind of how that works. So this will be different, and uh, I'm going to talk for a little while tonight, and uh, hopefully I'll give you something to teach you a little bit about how to stay sober. And that's what the whole deal is, how to stay clean, how to stay sober, how to stay out of whatever your addiction might be. And how many are addicted to more? You're addicted to more of anything. Yeah. We're all addicted to something, and uh, that's why we come. And, but the, the thing that I found, whether it's alcohol or drugs or gambling or sex or whatever, when you're, you're addicted to it, the solution all comes up about the same. The solution is pretty close to the same. So tonight I want to talk to you about your spiritual condition. And we're going to go into that. You're granted a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of a spiritual condition. We're going to talk about what that spiritual condition looks like. The entry point to your spiritual condition is your narrative. I love the Disney movies where they had a narrative. You know, it all started, the narrative movies, they started back with Lassie. How many remember Lassie? You're really old if you remember Lassie. <laughs> Lassie was the dog that was too smart for his own good, and, and or her own good, I guess it was a female dog, and, and Lassie would go out and, and they'd find whoever it was that fell off the cliff, blah, 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 and come back, and Lassie would be barking, woof, 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 you know, and, and the guy would be standing there, and the narrator would be telling you what Lassie was saying. You know, you got to go down to the trail. It's about a hundred feet. There's a tree that's fallen over on top of the fence. It's an old red painted fence. And the narrator is talking all about what the dog is saying. You know, it's just a load of nonsense, but it really tied it all together because it, it took the gaps in the movie. It took the gaps in the story and pulled it together. It filled in the gaps. You in your life have a narration that runs in your mind. And in your narration, it's the piece that you do that fills in the gaps. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I said, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. The quieter you are, the longer I'm going to talk tonight. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That's better. You're, not, you're quieter than that Episcopal church I was in this morning. And the, I was the youngest person there. That's all I can tell you. It's heaven's waiting room. That's what I always tell them when I go over there. It's a pretty amazing church. So what we have is this narration, and our narration is fed by external things. We have movies, and we have news, and we have all kinds of things that feed our narration. Your narration is your story that you're telling. It's what you're using to fill in the gap. You do narration all the time, whether you know it or not. You narrate your conversations before they get there. You've already figured out what you're going to say and what they're going to say and how you're going to... And you have the whole narration going on. We narrate things when we're angry. I'm going to narrate things when you get angry. Yeah, you have a narration and it's filled with profanity. You're cussing in your head. You know, you got it going on. We narrate things when we're afraid. We narrate things when we're challenged. When we, we narrate these situations when, when, we, when we're feeling confronted, when we have to confront something. We narrate. We narrate when we go to a job interview. How many have ever narrated your way in? You know, you've already got the narration. You filled out the application and you lied on it. And then you were praying that God would somehow honor that. And, uh, and you go in. I'm not exactly sure how it works. But we narrate it. And we've got it all figured out. How we're going to answer and what we're going to say. And then when we get there, it never is like you think. It's not going to be like you think. That's one of the things my son over in prison has told me. He said, when the fights are getting ready to start, he said, I always know the guy's going to win. Because the guy that's going to win goes, it ain't going to be like you think. And he said, that's the guy that's going to win. It's never going to be exactly like you think. So we have this narration that goes on. A couple of things that we know about narratives that are, that, that are in our head. They're grief and hopelessness and despair and anger and even fear resist the narrative. Whatever you're saying, I can tell you if you have those other emotions, those other feelings, those other things that are going on, it will become something that resists the narrative that you're speaking. That's why we need to be sure we know what our narrative is. In your narrative, without accurate detail, it just becomes, narratives become endless ramblings. We call it obsession. How many are obsessive in your thinking? You get a thought, boy, and it just goes and goes. And it's just the same tape playing over and over and over and over it, it, without accurate detail. And on the flip side, if you get too much detail, do you know what? Those become ramblings too. You have to find 
accurate detail, truthful detail, and balance your narratives out. All of this self-talk, listen to me now, all of the self-talk and all of the craziness, this external craziness that's feeding your self-talk becomes kind of a sustained narrative by itself, which left unattended, unchallenged, begins to be your history. Your narrative is the thing that's writing your history. What you're telling yourself today is what you'll end up doing tomorrow. If you won't talk about it, you won't do it. On the, on the flip side of that very coin, when you begin to talk about it in your narrative, it's the next thing that you're going to do. If you want to know the direction you're going to steer your life, you begin to listen to what your narrative is. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get in a relationship and we're going to get married and we're going to have children and it's going to be wonderful. That's, that's only part of the narrative. You, you need to measure that. Now, you need to actually get around some people that have been married a while and let them speak to your narrative. Come on now. Let them tell you what the narrative is. Get around the people that did get hooked up in rehab and let them talk to you about their narrative and what it was really like, not what you fantasized that it would be like. There's a narrative that's building, building your future, and by the way, that's where your history comes from. And your history is just a byproduct of all of this broken narrative. See, there's some recovery narratives that I want to challenge, and then I'm going to move into this place called your spiritual condition. Recovery narratives. The big book talks about it. It says some have hold out, held on to our old ideas, and the result was yeah. until we let go. Absolutely. See, our old ideas, some of the old ideas, and we're going to tie this into this spiritual life, some of our old ideas are wrong. Some of our old ideas, even since we've been sober, are wrong. You, you know, I have people that quote out of the big book all the time. The, the people will say, no, the big book says no relationships in the first year. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say nothing about it at all. It says, the big book says 90 meetings in 90 days. It does not. It's not in there anywhere. Is that a bad idea? I don't think it's a bad idea. Uh, you know, I can hang out in the bar. That's a real bad misnomer that some people have. The big book doesn't say you can hang out in the bar. Uh, there's a whole narrative on that. But what we do is we spin it up to what we want it to say. We have some broken narrative. Let me tell you some narratives that you need to place in your recovery narrative so you can build the spiritual foundation. You see, it wasn't just one person that said, I stopped going to meetings and went out. It was a lot. That's a recovery narrative. It wasn't just one person that said, I got into a bad relationship and I went out. It was many. It wasn't just one person that said, I had no connection with God, didn't feel like I needed it, and then I went out. It was a lot of people that said that. I didn't get a sponsor, and I didn't follow the direction, and I didn't do the step. It wasn't just one person. It was a lot. Build your narrative, not often one, what one person said, but build it off of that collective voice. The only way that you get that collective voice is by going to a lot of meetings and hanging around a lot of recovery people. The narrative that I had in my first year of sobriety is a whole lot different than the narrative I have today. The narrative I had in my first year of ministry 28 years ago when I was ordained is a lot different than the narrative I have now. The narrative I had about the Salvation Army is different than it was 10 years ago. And I, see, for me today, the narrative's different. Ten years ago, when somebody out on the porch threatened to kill me, you know, I kind of walked around with it all day, and I, I kind of worried about it and thought maybe I should arm myself. Today, when the guy threatened me, I, I just kind of laughed. I said, yeah, right, that ain't going to happen. Go, go away. You know, when, when the guy threatened Melissa to kick her head in, and then I said, you're gone. That's it, give me your tag, and he's gone. He's not coming back ever as far as I'm concerned. My narrative is a whole lot different. And I'm not afraid of people. That, I'm not afraid of I'm going to hurt your feelings. I'm just me today. And I can tell you my narrative changed enough so that I become comfortable. I hope your narrative, you need to measure what that looks like. On the other side of the coin, I've never heard from anyone, I learned too much and I went out. I've never heard anybody say that. I read too many books on addiction and I ended up using drugs. I've never heard this. Have you ever heard that? That not too many. I, I asked too many questions and I got confused and went out. I've never heard that. Or I spend too much time in prayer. I work too hard on the steps. You see, that's not part of it. There has to be a truth in our narrative. Truth 
can walk around naked and nobody notices. But a lie will always need to be dressed up. When you begin to write your narrative in your head, you begin to write the narrative of your sober life, you need to make sure that what you're telling yourself is the truth. Deception that is believed is truth. Are y'all still listening or not? Deception that's believed as truth will have the same impact as if it were true. You need to make sure you're not telling yourself a load of hooey. Because the, the problem is, you're very good at what you do. You tell yourself a load of hooey and then you buy into it because you're such a slick con artist, you can even con yourself. Look at the person next to you and say, I think he's talking to you right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> Honesty comes from within, so make sure. Make sure that before you speak out loud that your words will improve the silence. Make sure your narrative is going to improve your life and not cause your life some other kinds of, some other parts of this broken narrative. Some parts that this, this really kind of moves it over a little bit. But pain causes change. I hear people talk about it in the meetings. Oh, well, I got enough pain. That really is why I change. No, pain doesn't cause change. Pain only produces a desire to change. Knowledge is what produces change. And knowledge, knowledge without God doesn't produce much change. You need to have knowledge that's connected with the Spirit of God in order to change. Pain is not going to change you. If you get into pain in your recovery, if the pain in your recovery is ever greater than the pain of the consequence of going back into your addiction, you will head back to your addiction. Pain does not produce change at all. Time produces change. Some people believe that's not true. Time does not produce change. Time heals all wounds. Time heals nothing. Time may make you forget, but it will not heal. If time heals, God is not necessary. There are old alcoholics and there are young people in sobriety. That's how I know time doesn't heal. If time healed, those old alcoholics eventually would just get better, wouldn't they? You know, you see them, they're, they're 90 years old, they're still out there banging. I saw a lady today, homeless lady. She's 84 years old, still arguing about being homeless. You know, she, I said, really? I said, you shouldn't be homeless. I said, you're breaking my rules if you stay homeless one more day. 84 years old, are you kidding? She still thinks she's going to get it all turned around. I said, you need to step in, let somebody help you. Need causes change. Need doesn't change anything. Need does not produce change. How many have something that you need in your life tonight? Come on, let me see your hand. How many got something you need? You know what? That need is not going to produce the change. That need doesn't change. There are 20-year-old millionaires and 75-year-old people without a dime. They have a need, but that doesn't produce change. Knowledge produces change. Divine knowledge produces permanent change. There is some knowledge that will come to you by way of counsel, by way of therapy, by, by way of sitting in the recovery meetings and I like that knowledge. But I can tell you, it's only divine knowledge that produces permanent change. You would need to find that knowledge that comes from God. So what it says on page 85 of the big book is this, is what we really have is a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of our spiritual condition. This is true. If it's true, and I believe it is, then the statement presupposes a couple things. See, your narrative about God and your narrative about spiritual life, you need to understand this daily reprieve. Let me explain it to you because some of your church people, some of you get over on the church side and you go and you find the Lord. I, I think that's a good thing. How many have found the Lord since you've been sober? Let me see your hand. The rest of you need to get with it. You need to find the Lord. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. I believe in finding the Lord. I found the Lord and still got drunk. As a matter of fact, I knew the Lord before I ever started drinking. I know a lot of alcoholics and a lot of drug addicts and a lot of people addicted to all kinds of stuff that have a relationship with God. They know the Lord, but I can tell you it will not be sufficient. That's like saying if you find the Lord and you're a diabetic, as soon as you find the Lord, you'll no longer be a diabetic. How many know that's not true? And even if you did find the Lord and God healed you of diabetes and you go down to Dunkin' Donuts and slam a dozen glazed every morning, you're going to die of you know, uh, some kind of coma. You're going to just check right out. 
And the same thing applies. Because you found the Lord doesn't exempt you from the need to measure your daily spiritual life. As a matter of fact, it is the prerequisite to finding that spiritual life. To measure your spiritual condition, you'll have to take stock of this. This daily reprieve is available. However, it requires some work. Say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. You see, I told you you're going to have to work. You didn't want to work. You was hoping I'd give you something for free. No, nothing free. See, this daily reprieve presupposes that God is in the mix. That's a given. If your recovery is based on, not based on a relationship with God, it's based on spiritual conjecture or concept or even a spiritual feeling, but it's not based on fact. Your relationship with God is the first and foremost in all of this. But the daily reprieve doesn't stop there. And you got to know it's a daily reprieve and not a periodic reprieve or an annual reprieve. One time my sponsor called me up and he said, David, you're going to get drunk if you don't straighten up. And I said, what? He goes, David, what's wrong with you? I said, well, I don't know. Things are going pretty good at home. Blah, 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 blah. The kids are all doing great, great. He said, David, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. Things at work seem to be really good. Things are rolling along. I'm in good space and things are going good at work. He said, but David, what's wrong with you? I said, well, things are going good. I'm going to meetings. I'm sponsoring a couple guys. You know, I, I got to go. In. And he continued to ask. So finally I said, I don't know. You tell me what's wrong with me. He said, David, here's the deal. You're staying sober a year at a time and not a day at a time. And if you don't spin that around, you're going to get drunk. I was sober about 14 years then. He was absolutely right. I was not keeping a daily reprieve. I was keeping an annual reprieve. I figured I had it all locked in and it really didn't matter. This word reprieve that comes is a, a noun form. A cancellation or postponement of a punishment. That's a reprieve. A stay of execution. A remission, a pardon, or an amnesty. That's a reprieve. A temporary escape from an undesirable fate or an unpleasant situation. We get a daily reprieve based on our spiritual condition. So from that statement, there's some things that you can know for sure. One, you can know and measure your spiritual condition. It does not have to remain a mystery. You can know what your spiritual condition is and you can measure your spiritual condition at will. The second part of this is you can change or correct your concepts of spiritual condition. Your spiritual condition. What condition is your condition in? There was an old song in the 70s. You remember that, Alan? I, I just dropped in to see what condition my what condition was in. Can you tell me who sang that? Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers in the first edition. How many remember that song? How many remember Kenny Rogers? How many have ever ate chicken? I mean, come on. No. <laughs> my condition. What's my spiritual condition? Not only I can measure it, I can do something about it. This idea that our spiritual life is some kind of random Occurrence, and we're, we're just going to float along and we'll come see, come saw. You lived your life in addiction that way. How could that, if that's the problem, be the solution? Our spiritual condition can be modified or adjusted at will. You can do something about your spiritual life. You can change your spiritual life. You don't have to remain a train wreck all the time. The, the next piece is that we can build our spiritual life. We can improve it. We can build on it. Not just change it, but we can build it. There is no limit to how far you can go in your spiritual walk. The last one I want to give you is you can speak about your spiritual life. You can talk about your spiritual condition without apology and without embarrassment. You can talk about where you're at spiritually. One of the fallacies that I found over in the church was this. As I'd go, but I didn't dare ever say anything about what was really going on with me. Because I figured they would judge me. I figured, it, and a lot of people do that when they go to the recovery rooms. Everything is not always wonderful. And if you come to the meetings long enough with me, and you continue to say everything's wonderful, I'm going to challenge you on your deception. Because it's not always wonderful. And you're not always feeling just great. And you're not always happy, joyous, and free. Unless your meds are balanced, and then maybe you are. <laughs> I'm not always happy, joyous, and free, and I've been sober probably longer than anybody else here. Sometimes I'm restless, irritable, and 
Oh, you're familiar with this. <laughs> this is good. I'm not alone. Are you, are you at liberty in your life? Are you at liberty to step into a meeting? Do you feel confident enough in your spiritual life to tell people that you're restless and you're irritable and you're discontent and you don't know why? It's a measure of your spiritual condition. Can you talk that way? Or do you need to pretend like everything is wonderful all the time? Because as long as you pretend everything's wonderful all the time, you have stopped your spiritual growth. And I can tell you that daily reprieve begins to fade. It begins to move in loops away from you. And suddenly you don't feel spiritual at all. Am I talking to the right group or not? You know, one day you're praying and you're feeling like the whole world is right there and you got it going. And then five days later you can't even find God. You don't know, you know, I'm not even sure if you believe in God. That's a spiritual fade. It's a slow fade and it will happen to you unless you talk about the reality of where you're at. That spiritual condition you need to be able to talk about it and if you're not in a setting where you can you need to get into that setting. If you have a home group and all they do is sit around and cuss and talk about hanging out and smoking dope, you need to dump that group of losers and find somebody that will talk to you about your spiritual life. I can tell you if you have a church that's all hallelujah and amen and there's nobody challenging your life, then you need to get out of that church and find a place where somebody will look you in the eye and tell you the truth. I'd rather you tell me the truth now while I'm sober than come to me later and say, you know, I thought you was messing up. But I just didn't want to hurt your feelings because then I'll probably punch you in the head. Don't come visit me in treatment and say, I thought you was messing up. You need to find somebody that will challenge you in your spiritual life. Say amen or oh me, one of the two. Amen. So there are three components of your spiritual life that I want to talk to you about. Just for the next few minutes. I'm only going to go another 15 minutes probably at the most. Three components of your spiritual life. I'm going to give them to you. If you're taking notes, there's not one person in here tonight writing this down. He's recording it so you can sell those at a high cost because <laughs> nobody got it written down. The first one I want to give you is the capacity to receive sobriety and God's power. The capacity to receive. The second is the discipline to retain sobriety and God's power. And the third is the authenticity to transmit sobriety in God's power. The capacity to receive. The capacity to receive. You see, your capacity grows with exposure and usage and awareness. You need to build your capacity to receive sobriety. You need to understand that this capacity doesn't come automatically. I have to measure my capacity to receive sobriety on a regular basis. I have to measure when I go to a meeting, am I able to listen or not? Are you able to listen and hear what's being said? Or are you judging the people? I See, I used to be a sniper. We got any snipers in here? I was an AA sniper. I was the guy that waited till the end of the meeting. Are there any burning desires? And what I did is I found out everything that everybody said that I disagreed with. I spun it around and I took pot shots at all of that. Come on now, there's a couple people laughing in here. You're them AANA snipers. I was a sniper. And I'd shoot down everything you said. I felt like I was judge and jury. I was the executioner. And I had to call you on your stuff to see if I could make you look silly. Now, if there are snipers in the room, I, I wait till they snipe and then I throw a hand grenade because I'll double dip in a second. You're right. I've been sober forever. What are you going to do? Throw me out? You can't get rid of me. I'll blow you right up. I'll blow you up in your little sniper routine. But I had that going on. You see, I didn't have the ability. Listen, are you all listening? Say, I'm listening. Meetings. You stopped going to meetings because you lost your capacity to receive anything in the meeting. You went to the meeting and, you know, you got, I got nothing out. And I hear people tell me that. I don't get nothing out of those meetings. You don't put anything in either, apparently. You go to a meeting and you get nothing out of the meeting. There's one thing that God has assigned you to do. That's when the newcomer gets up to go up and pick up their, their, their beginner chip. You get to observe the grace of God entering another person's life. Don't ever forget there's a reason why you're at the meeting. You need to change how you view meetings. And you need to begin to take notes while you're in meetings. Say amen. Amen. You need to take notes. I still take notes. I still write things down. I still have the capacity to receive. 
even from somebody that's brand new. Some of the best things I hear about sobriety are from somebody that's a newcomer. Most of the old timers, I've heard everything they had to say twice, you know, and I don't listen to that as well, but I can get a newcomer. That's why you need to sponsor people, why you need to learn how to give this away. We're going to talk about that because I have to have the capacity to receive sobriety. In that capacity, it includes change. I have to be able to change. If you don't change your life, your sobriety day will change. You're going to have to change and continue to change. And that's the whole key to receiving sobriety is my willingness to change and adapt and throw down ideas that are no longer valid or maybe never were. You have to have the ability and your capacity to receive correction. The adjustment without offense. Failure without collapse. I have to have the ability to fail. I have to have the ability to adjust. And I have to allow you to speak to me. Correction. I have people that speak into my life. And they tell me the wrong thing. you got to understand, I've got to have that ability to receive correction without being offended. Can you do that without being offended? I have to have the ability in my capacity to receive sobriety, to receive criticism. Sometimes being judged without becoming judgmental. Sometimes false things are said sometimes weaknesses are pointed out but there are people that criticize you and by the way by the way the further up you go the more likely you are to get criticized i know people that would arm wrestle to get my job because they think there's a big paycheck attached to it may i help you with something there is however you don't get to see the whole deal and the truth be known I have to take criticism. The, the more responsibility I take on, the more I have to take criticism. And, and I have to take criticism with a grain of salt. It's part of my spiritual life. And I have to learn how to take compliments. That's hearing truth without becoming prideful. Without a prideful response. Knowing the source of my success comes from God. The capacity, the space, the ability, the capability, the fitness to receive. That's my capacity. So let me challenge you tonight. What's your capacity to receive sobriety? What is it based on? Your whole life, your whole spiritual life is revolving around one thing. Can you continue to receive? Because if you don't, then you'll stop going to the meetings. If you don't, you'll stop going to church. You'll stop receiving the thing that you need to receive. And you need to receive based on a daily reprieve. There's a daily reprieve that allows me, that insists on me receiving. I have to have the capacity. I'll give you a little story out of the scripture. There's a story about Elijah and Elisha. How many remember that story? How many have ever heard the story of Elijah? Elijah was a prophet, a great prophet. He called down fire from heaven. He did all kinds of things. He was a pretty, pretty potent guy, you know. And Elisha was a servant guy that wanted to be Elijah's right-hand man. So Elisha got up with Elijah and they were walking together. Elijah told him, he said, you wait here, I'll be back. Elisha said, not as you live and breathe. Because he heard about the last guy that he got left off somewhere. Elijah and Elisha were traveling together. And finally, there came the day that Elijah was going to be caught up. How many would like to know the day you die? Elijah knew when he was going to die. How many would like to know the day you die? How many would like to know as long as it wasn't tomorrow? You wouldn't want to know about tomorrow. That'd be a tragedy. Elijah was going to be caught up. And Elisha knew it. And Elijah turned to Elisha and he said, What is it you want from me anyhow? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Well, the church is twisting that around to make it a double portion of the Holy Spirit. There is no such thing. There's only one Holy Spirit and He's all powerful. A double portion of your spirit. A double portion of your capacity to receive and to retain and to transmit God's power. That's what he was asking for. A double portion of what you've achieved in your life, I'd like to achieve twice that. Anybody that I mentor, anybody that I sponsor, anybody that I bring along in ministry, I anticipate from the beginning that they will do twice as much in their life as I've ever done in mine. How many like to get mentored under that, that rule right there? There's some of you. How many like to pay the price for that rule right there? That's, a, ah, that's another subject. The capacity... The capacity is increased 
And it requires responsibility and trust. You need. How many want to increase your capacity to receive sobriety? Then you'll need to work on it. Work on the things that are the blocks when you go to meeting. This is about your spiritual life. And if you don't feed your spiritual life, if you don't retain that capacity by reading books or by going to meetings or by hearing preachers or by listening to the right music, if you don't, then the, then the capacity diminishes by itself. Your ability to receive has to be first and foremost in your spiritual life. The second is the discipline to retain God's power. God's power, God's sobriety. There's a way that I retain sobriety. It's not enough that sobriety comes to me, but I have to have the disciplines built into my life to retain it. Disciplines include prayer, purity of focus, and obedience. The price of spiritual progress is obedience to the known will of God. And for me, I have to retain that. I have to spend my time and discipline my life to spend the time in prayer. You will not retain what you receive unless you hold on to it in a spiritual way. Tonight, what I'm telling you may bounce off your head. You might forget all about it by the time you get to bargain. But there will probably be a few of you that will have the discipline to retain it. Part of my way that I retain what I hear is I write down what I hear. I write notes all the time. I write notes when I'm ready to speak. I write notes when Alan's ready to speak. I write notes when I'm sitting in the AA meeting. I write notes in church. I write notes to myself while I'm driving in the car. Well, I, I do a little voice thing. You know, I don't You can't do that. But I got to tell you, I write things down. I capture them. And I review them. And I memorize them. Because if you don't do that, you see, that discipline will cause your capacity to shrink. The discipline is the only thing that keeps my capacity strong. I'm disciplined in my prayer. I'm disciplined in my study. You know what? You can't stay sober just on a whim. You will need to, you will need to actually discipline your life. Some of us were working on making our bed every morning. I hear people talk about that. Yeah, I want to make my bed every morning. Yeah, but you're still cussing like a drunken sailor. Maybe you ought to do something besides make your bed. You know, stop pretending that you're praying while you're down there finding your keys under your bed and actually pray. That might be a good idea. There comes a place where I need to have those disciplines active in my life. Sometimes the discipline is going to a meeting when I don't feel like going to a meeting. Or going to church when I don't feel like getting out of bed and going to church. Or going and speaking at the conference when I don't feel like speaking at the conference. And that happens sometimes. There's sometimes I'm in the middle of it. I was last weekend, last Saturday, I was up in Pennsylvania. And on Friday, I'd been sick for a couple of days, and on Friday I was thinking, man, I don't know why I agreed to speak at this thing. It was a big graduation thing. I said, I don't want to go speak over there. You know what? I had to discipline myself to get up and do what I needed to do to go speak. I was so glad I did. Seventeen ladies graduated out of that program. There were about four or five hundred people there. It was a great event. But the discipline to do that, I travel and speak a lot, and it requires a lot of discipline. Your spiritual life, your daily reprieve requires that you discipline yourself. We have the capacity to receive, the discipline to retain, and the last one which is probably as important as the other two is the authenticity to transmit sobriety. To transmit that recovery that you have, you need to be authentic. You don't ever transmit something to somebody unless they trust you. The authenticity to transmit includes the willingness, the opportunity, and the perception. You can't sponsor somebody that doesn't think you have anything to offer. And by the way, by the way. you need to sponsor people. Say, who, me? Who, say, me? who, me? Come on now. Me. Yeah, you. Do you know why I say why? why? I'll make you interactive if I have to work all night at it. you know why I say why? Why? Because it's the only way that you keep yourself open so your capacity is open. You've got to give away what you've got. It gives more space for more to come in. The only way that you'll discipline yourself to keep what you have fresh and alive is when you're authentic and you're giving it away to somebody else. The greatest thing that ever happened to me in my sobriety is God called me to do Tuesday night. Now, God called me to do Tuesday night long before Tuesday night started. That class that I do on Tuesday night has been running for about 25 years now. 
I have taught it on not, almost nonstop for the last 25 years. When I do the little 12 week series that I go through every every 12 weeks, they call it the Sutton Show. Has anybody been to the Sutton? Are y'all familiar? Wave your hand at me if you're still breathing. Come on now. I want to move you back across into the hot box over there. I got to tell you something. God didn't call it the Sutton Show when He called it me to it. Nor did He call me to sing a, a oldies music. Nor did He call me to tell nearly not ready for church jokes. He, he just told me to go and start teaching this, and I've been teaching it for a long long time. I can tell you that I need to be authentic in that. Somebody said, I had somebody who was complaining because they felt like I should dress up and I should always have a tie. And I said, you know, that's not being authentic. The, the real me doesn't walk around. I don't sleep with a necktie on. I have to wear it for work. But I need to be authentic. I need to be real. That's why I tell the not ready for church jokes. I can't tell the same jokes on Sunday morning, Alan, as I tell on Tuesday night because they, they won't invite me back. You know, I've gotten real close to the edge a couple times. I thought, man, I better not. I, 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 I don't remember what the rest of the joke was. I, be, I bailed in the middle of the story. But you have to know there's a there's an authenticity to it. You can be a sponsor. You can be a leader. You can be if you'll be genuine. But there ain't nobody wants to hear from somebody that sounds like something out of a Cracker Jack box. That's a lot of the challenge the church has. They don't seem to be authentic. They don't seem to be real. If you will be real with people, people will flock to what you have to say. If you sound like, you sound like, I know a guy, he's sober, uh, well, I don't know. He says he's sober a long time. I'm not, I just, well, anyhow. Suffice it to say, I know this guy. And, uh, and everything he says, he's supposed to be sober like over 25 years. And everything he says, he couches with, well, you know, my sponsor was one of the old, old, old timers, the really old, old timers, and what my sponsor said. He says that every time he talks. He's not authentic at all. I said, have you ever had an original idea at all? He doesn't like me that well. Of course, I don't like him, so it works out pretty good. So have you ever had an original idea? You blame everything on your sponsor. I've been listening to you for years. Your sponsor didn't tell you all that crap. That's stuff you make up and blame him for. Maybe that's why he doesn't like me, but I feel like if he'd ever become authentic, he'd probably have something really important to say. And if you ever become religious in the way you present, or you ever become starchy in the way you present, or you ever become legalistic in the, in the recovery rooms, there's people to become legalistic. We call them big book Nazis. How many know about the big book Nazis? <laughs> well, they walk around with a book and they're ready to flog you with that book. Look at this page. You know, if you become like that, you're not authentic. People don't live like that. People want somebody that's going to be real. When you start talking to somebody, you just need to talk to them like you talk to anybody else. Don't come in with a bunch of recovery ease and all that stuff. I'm telling you what, we get so far off the track. You need to be real. You need to be genuine. You need to be authentic. If your, your authenticity will carry you when nothing else will. There comes a place. In this being authentic, it's not, you gotta understand, it's not becoming invisible. Many become invisible in their faith. To the non believer, they do not appear to be any different than anyone else. Their music sounds the same, they watch the same movies, they watch the same television programs, they go to the same places. Nobody can tell that they're genuine believers. That life will produce very little fruit. I'm authentic in who I am and what I do. It's an authentic thing. It's a, the real deal thing. That's why I don't go to bars. I, I can go to bars, I suppose, and hang out. It's never been one of my spiritual goals, conquest, that I'd be able to go hang out with a bunch of drunk people. I don't know, some people seem to have that as a spiritual goal. For me, I don't do that. How can I tell the newcomer to stay out of those places if I go hang out there myself? That's not being authentic. I need to be genuine. So that what you see is what you get. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much the same all the time. The only difference about what you see when I'm here teaching and what you see when you, if you get close to my personal life is that I'm a very private person and I don't appear to be a very private person while I'm here. That's the great part of me teaching. Because I, I, you know, left to my own resources, I just go off by myself, leave me alone. I buy a truck, go on the road. I did that one time. Go on a semi and just drove, you know. And, and that's, that's kind of really the way I am. But the truth is my sobriety is the same. Whether you're here or you're with me outside of here. You need to be authentic. You need to be genuine. 
You need to be the person that's the real person when somebody walks in. Whether it's Celebrate Recovery, whether it's an AA meeting or an NA meeting or a church service, you better be the most genuine person there. You need to be real with them. You just need to walk up and genuinely care about them. That's all that it really takes. You've got to come to that place. So when we do this spiritual life, that it's not just random occurrence. Spiritual life is, is, is that capacity to receive, that discipline to retain, and the authenticity to transmit what I have. I have worked for now 35 years to build those three components into my spiritual life, and my spiritual life remains strong. Is it set up for the rest of my life? No, it's set up for today, though. It's set up probably, probably in pretty good shape this week. I spent a lot of good prayer time this past week. I'll be in good shape this week. You leave me without prayer and you leave me without study and you leave me without receiving and you leave me without the disciplines and you leave me and I become less than authentic. I become disingenuous. You know what happens is I become really hard to get along with. If you want, you can ask my wife about that. She'll tell you. I tell her I know I'm hard to live with. I, I, if I'm not in my spiritual place, I can tell you I'm not the easiest person to get along with. I can tell you that tonight because I'm authentic. There's an authenticity about this life that I have. This, this genuine relationship with the Lord. You can have that. You can stay authentic. You can be authentic. You can be the person that reaches somebody when nobody else can reach them. If you keep your spiritual life in tone. Remember that this is not about becoming invisible. It's about becoming transparent, Amen. which are two different subjects. You need to be transparent. You need to be, people need to be able to look at you and see right through you. you you got to get all of the mask off and all of the facade. you got to take it down. Allow people to see the real you. Because it's your image. Say my image. My image. Say my image. My image. Blocks God's image. Blocks God's, God's image. image. The reason you don't have God's image in your life is because your image is too big. He needs to increase and I need to decrease. And when I become authentic, I become transparent. And then His image can be seen in me. Then I have something to offer. What I have to offer you tonight, if it doesn't come from God, it's not worth much. Amen just left to my own resources. I'm just not that good at this stuff. But when God's in the middle of it, then we have something that's genuine. Mm -hmm. Granted a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of a spiritual condition. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can receive from you on any day. That we can hear your voice that we can know you. We ask tonight that each person that's here would find the capacity to receive from you. They'd find that, that discipline to retain your love and your power and your mercy and your grace. Lord, we ask tonight that we would be the genuine, we'd be the real deal, the authentic people that you want us to be. We give you all the praise tonight for this meeting and all the lives that have been touched in this Celebrate Recovery. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Amen.
There's a lot of great stories in here. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we'd really like you to get one. So um, tonight we're going to give one away, and Don's going to read the number here. I will. Thank you, Dr. David Sutton. Very good tonight. Yeah. Yes. Are we ready? Nine zero six seven one zero eight. Oh my gosh. Ray. What? Okay. All right, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to give away some chips, some coins. These are Celebrate Recovery coins. They're a little bit different than regular recovery coins that you receive in NA and NA for periods of time of uh, sobriety. What these are, they can, be, they can mark times of sobriety. They can also mark times that you have surrendered to Christ as your Savior. 